Welcome to Daily Office Devotions. I'm Reggie Kidd, and every Monday through Friday, I offer devotional observations on some portion of that day's readings for morning prayer in the Book of Common Prayer. Thanks so much for joining me this Wednesday following the 15th Sunday after Pentecost. Now, because of my travel schedule, last week and this week, we're taking a detour in our devotionals. Today's is the eighth of ten devotionals that treat Paul's last three letters, those to his ministry protégés, Timothy and Titus. Last week, in the first three devotionals on the so-called pastoral epistles, 1st and 2nd Timothy and Titus, we saw how God overcomes our lack of faith, hope, and love. Following those three meditations are four devotionals in which we show how God implants in us basic ingredients of human flourishing, godliness and temperance, which we treated last Thursday and Friday, and justice and courage, which we treated the past two days. Finally, in these last three devotionals of this special series on the pastorals, we will see how Paul inspires us to faith, hope, and love. We close this series on the pastoral epistles then, where we started with faith, hope, and love. These three are often called the theological virtues. And here is perhaps the place to acknowledge my debt to the medieval Italian poet Dante for the structuring of these 10 meditations. The outline I've adopted mirrors Dante's journey through heaven in his third volume of the Divine Comedy, the Paradiso. As he moves up through the planetary spheres, Dante sees bad faith, the moon, misplaced hope, Mercury, and disordered love, Venus, being fixed by Christ. Next, he goes through planets where Christ teaches his followers how to live up to the classical world's four cardinal virtues, making us teachers of true truth, the sun, courageous warriors, Mars, just rulers, Jupiter, and masters of our appetites, Saturn. Finally, Dante shows both the integration of the theological and cardinal virtues, as well as the primacy of the theological virtues. He does so by climaxing the pilgrim's journey through the heavenly spheres with examinations on faith by Peter, bearer of the keys of the kingdom, on hope by James, counselor to patience in suffering, and on love by John, the beloved disciple. Dante's point, I think, is that Christ has come to ennoble human aspirations to the good life, wisdom, courage, justice, and temperance, but only through a redemption that begins and ends with faith, hope, and love. What makes the pastoral epistles so very special in the canon of Christian scripture is the unique way Paul, the author of the three theological virtues, takes account of the four cardinal virtues of the classical and Hellenistic world. He claims them for Christ and incorporates them into a Christian vision of a good and noble life. Faith grounds us and gives us wings. Early in this final section of the Paradiso, Dante muses over the irony of faith grounding us in reality by inviting us to believe in unseen things. Following the Latin translation of Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, faith, observes Dante, is the substantia, that which stands under, sub plus stare, of things hoped for, Paradiso 24, 64. For our lives to mean anything, all of us believe in more than what we see. From the force of gravity to the sun's rising and setting, from the validity of principles of right and wrong to the veracity of stories about our ancestors, the key to life is basing our lives on the right unseen realities. And faith in those unseen verities gives our lives wings. Interestingly, all three of the main books of the Divine Comedy, the Inferno, the Purgatorio, and the Paradiso, end with the word stars. Faith lets you stand upon those things that are beneath the surface of things, and when you take your stand on them, then you can hope for things above, 
Faith enables you to reach for the stars. In the pastoral epistles, faith enables us to reach for the stars. People on the island of Crete had an ancient belief that Zeus had originally been a human who ascended to deity by his righteous deeds. They were raised to believe that they too could live such virtuous lives that they could become gods themselves if they reached for the stars in their mastery of themselves, in their practice of justice with other human beings, and if they did right by the gods, if they did so, they could become like Zeus, gods. Their basic religious spirit amounted to something like an anticipation of Mormonism, the byline of which is, what we are now, the Father once was, and what the Father now is, we shall become. Cretans' upside-down faith won them the mockery of non-Cretan Greeks and the self-critical remark of one of their own prophets. Cretans are always liars, vicious beasts, lazy gluttons. Titus chapter 1, verse 12. The temptation for Cretans was to view Christ the way the 20th century novelist Nikos Kazantzakis, himself from Crete, was to envision him. As a man who rose to divinity by self-mastery, righteous living, and pleasing of the divine. Such faith would be entirely misplaced. Such reaching for the stars would fall far short. To counter such ideas and to encourage a faith that would ennoble us rather than finally degrade us, Paul pointed to Christ as not a man who had ascended to deity. Paul portrayed, Paul portrayed Christ for the Cretans rather as God's very own attributes descended to us. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all, training us to live lives that are self-controlled, upright, and godly, and but when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, he saved us, not because of any righteous works, any works of righteousness that we had done, but according to his mercy. It's Titus chapter 2, verses 11 and 12, and chapter 3, verses 4 and 5. If by God's grace and by the Holy Spirit's work within us, we humbly set aside our pride, and humbly accept this Christ, the Christ who has come down to us, we can indeed reach for and attain the stars. In the pastorals, faith grounds us. People from Ephesus had been shaped by a religious spirit opposite that of the people of Crete. They had been taught not that people rise to deity, but that deity had come down to them in the form of a lifeless rock. As a result, they prostrated themselves before things that degraded and belittled them. One of the smaller deities in Ephesus was Priapus, the god of the phallus. Ephesians were susceptible to sorcery and witchcraft, Acts chapter 19, verses 18 and 19. Paul feared that they would worship their wealth. As for, the, as for those who in the present age are rich, Command them not to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 17a and c. And Paul was shocked that they were attracted to demonically inspired and anti-humanistic and slothful disciplines, dietary restrictions and renunciation of marriage and domestic responsibility. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 5. Paul counters the life-denying religious spirit of Ephesus by pointing to the vibrant humanity of Christ. There is only one mediator between God and humanity, himself a human being, Christ Jesus. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5b in the New Jerusalem Bible. God grounds our lives in the one true human being who mediates his life to us and makes us over into new people. That's why Paul encourages Timothy to punch above his weight, not letting others intimidate him because of his age, not letting his own physical afflictions get the better of him. Take a little wine for your stomach, 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 23. Rekindling the gift he had received at the laying on of hands by Paul and others, being courageous. In this posture of strength, Timothy will be able to model the new self 
which Paul had already taught in Ephesians chapters 4 and 5, and into which God is forming his whole church. The faith that Paul encourages in all his letters, culminating in his counsel to Timothy and Titus, is extraordinary. We are called to have faith in the Christ who has brought heaven's life down to us. He does so, as he taught the Cretans, by embodying God's communicable attributes. He breaks us of a pride that we can build some sort of stairway to heaven, but then he lifts us up by imparting the very attributes of God, his own grace, kindness, and loving kindness so that we can live heaven's life in the here and now and reach for and ultimately attain the stars. At one and the same time, we are called to have faith in the Christ who has come down to us not as a dumb, lifeless, and life-denying rock. He has come not to make us subject to desires we cannot control like lust and greed and occultism. He has come to ground us in our full humanity, molding us into new people, fully embracing our calling as men and women, full of life and of love. Be blessed this day.